connections with people we didn't know because of course there are for everybody there was somebody whom you knew because I might surprise you we did a little bit of research of asking you how did you hear about this conference and we have spent so much time on preparing social media posts and adverts and then we figured out that there was probably, or there is probably two people in the room who heard about the event through social media and most of you indicated that you know about this event or you are here because you know somebody from the community who told you that you should be here or you should come. The other thing related to the connections, because of course this is one of our topics also today, is you probably saw that there is an opportunity to sign up for a random coffee. And there are already lots of names in the random coffee bowl. So if you haven't done that yet and you're up for a challenge not to just hang out in the coffee break with the people you know and you haven't seen for a long time, but would like to get to know somebody, um, then you can still put your name into the bowl and in the first coffee break there is already a poster you will find where you can find each other and organize. Another thingy, and then Mark wants also something else to say, we also have the, in the network app, so another practical thingy I'd like you to kind of just pull your attention to. You have the network app if you have downloaded, that's where we're going to distribute all the important informations. There was also a connectivity survey, so if you signed up that you wanted to be part of it, you might have received an email to you, into your email box, and maybe it's still not late if you haven't filled in the questionnaire, because it's only five questions, if I remember right, just to write some names there, because in the connectivity parallel session after lunch, we're going to work with the results of that survey. And I'm also trying to fill a little bit the air because of the streaming. We don't want to start the Aaron's speech before 10 o'clock because there are people who are waiting for that speech at 10. So is there anything else you think we should say in public before we move into our first keynote? So we have an informal competition going on <laughs> of which uh, this, is, this is gender specific to all the men in the room. Um, and now we're making it cross a uh, perfect. So for all, everyone in the room, we have a sock competition going on. There's been, I don't know how it started a few years back, but it doesn't really matter. But it's a movement. So. Um, competition. You said a competition. So there we go. So, so come, everybody, come, so here comes Rick. So anyone who's has socks, so by the end we need best socks of the conference. All right, so here we go. <laughs> so, so ladies and gentlemen, get your socks going and let's, let's have a sock off. Hey, it's going to be a 70 disco sock off. <laughs> it's a sock off. A sock off. There you go. Anyway, I wanted to let you know that, so there's still time to go shopping and do what you need to do. But um, just have a bit of fun with that, if you wouldn't mind. So thank you, Elder. Thank you, Mike. I mean, very professional so that we know when we work with newly set up teams that it's really becoming a team when they have a thingy they talk about and they know, yeah, now we have the sock thingy going on for a few years. So I think we're kind of pretty much warmed up with the connection part and ready to move over to the content. And about the content, um, there is first a confession again. When we were kind of designing what should be the theme of this year's conference, of course, we tried to build on what we heard last year in the conference, uh, what were the topics that were already emerging, and the ecosystem topic was really kind of already under every topic what we, what we touched or heard last year. And then we designed the theme, which is, as you see, designing business ecosystems. 
And what I would like to tell you with this is that in the process we learned a lot also about this topic. And one outcome of that is uh, that the title has changed also because we understood that you don't design business ecosystems, but you design for business ecosystems. And via this topic, we also we started to search for people who could inspire us and uh, maybe help for us stretch our thinking in these topics. And this is how we came across a Colony. And I'm really glad and happy to announce that today we have somebody, and it's not just anybody, but Aaron Fisher, who joined us and going to tell us a little bit more about what Colony is and what is the world that they are already helping to build. And how we planned is that Aaron is going to have about 20 minutes to talk to us. And then we have a Q&A session, so we'll have a little bit of time to, to talk and to ask questions also. So I hope he's prepared for that as well. And if we are at the connection part, then I will not leave out to mention that, of course, in the meantime, we also figured out that Aaron is from Budapest. But the speech will be in English. So thank you, and the floor is yours, Aaron. Yes, hello. Um, yeah, thank you. I do speak some Hungarian, but um, only at home and only with my father, so my vocabulary is limited. And even the Hungarians I know switch to English when they talk about this kind of development work. Um, okay, so my talk is entitled Smart Contract-Based Infrastructure for the Future of the Firm. And most of the time today I'm actually going to talk about what those words mean before I even get into what colony is. So the idea is there's so much technical background I would want to convey so that at the end you can maybe get a, an idea, a vision of what colony might be. Because if I jump straight into the development technology of colony, you're all going to get lost. But let me start with the word colony, so you know which, what we mean by colony. We mean uh, the ant colony. That was our uh, inspiring vision, the idea that every little ant does its own piece of work. But together, the colony as a whole shows tremendous swarm intelligence and can master feats of engineering that no single ant ever could imagine. And this is the kind of collective intelligence we want to harness over the internet. Um, so, talking of the internet, right, when the web came about in the 90s, there was tremendous excitement. Um, and this excitement was based on the idea that now anyone could publish. So, we have this no barrier to entry to global publishing. A you know, little bit. There was a small barrier, but, you know, technically you have to have the right equipment and knowledge. But now anyone could post text and publish it anywhere. And this led to, you know, global communications on a scale we've now gotten used to, but was completely unprecedented. And global cooperation on projects. And, you know, it's like taken for granted now, but I think it's still amazing that Wikipedia exists, right? Think of that. That is an amazing feat of cooperation. On all it took was to allow people all over the world to input text, to publish text. So just that was the only ingredient that needed, and we got this amazing project out of it. So the new ingredient that I want to introduce today is the blockchain, and that's a terrible buzzword because every, there's so much being written about it and so much misinformation. So let me start by saying what it isn't, right? It's not the trust machine. It's not digital currency. It's not peer-to-peer -peer cash. I mean, those are all aspects of it, but it, that's really kind of distorting the narrative. It is a tool. It's a new invention. It's, it is genuinely something new, and it allows us to do new things on the Internet that were absolutely impossible before. Um, and I'm going to introduce some of those. But so the thing it allows us to do, it allows us to do commerce and contractual agreements with strangers over the internet. Right? The web allowed us to do publishing and communication. This adds a commercial side to, to that. <coughs> so um, let me so introduce. The blockchain does have this currency application as its first example. The first application ever deployed on a public blockchain was a currency. And so the technology is robust enough to support that, but that's not all this is about. So here we see Bitcoin, the most famous one, Litecoin and Ether on the right, the internal currency of the Ethereum blockchain. Okay, so I mentioned the Ethereum blockchain. Let me bring it up. It's a general purpose blockchain that can run arbitrary computer code, not just the currency app, but any app. Right? And this code we run on there, we call them smart contracts. I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, 
So think about it maybe this way, Bitcoin is a single application device and uh, Ethereum is sort of the general purpose computing device that can do everything the other one can and a lot more. And to put things in context, Colony lives on top of Ethereum. Colony is a suite of smart contracts running on the Ethereum blockchain, uh, allowing for a management of work amongst anonymous collectives of the internet to self-manage and self-govern. And the vision is that we use these smart contracts uh, and other Web 3.0 technologies, meaning no servers and completely robust, resilient, distributed running systems that anyone can interact with that manage work and payment and reputation, disputes, arbitration, to allow collectives of people over the internet to self-organize and manage resources, finances, and work amongst themselves. Right? That's the vision. That's the goal. That's what we're trying to get, right? Is that clear? Is that, 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 that's the vision, okay? So it's a big vision. But the tools we have now... Like if all it took was allowing, giving everyone a publishing voice to make Wikipedia possible, if you add commerce to that, this is a very powerful new technology. It's still in its infancy, but these, this smart contracts is a really exciting new development. So let me explain what that means, because smart contracts are neither smart nor contracts. So the term is kind of, you know, it's, it, I explain where it comes from. I, this is how I'm going to draw them. It's just contracts, I draw them like that, but it's just computer code, right? I said a smart contract is just computer code running on this public blockchain, um, so that's all it is. Um, we like to call it smart because it's software, because code is more flexible than written text on paper. You know, my smartphone isn't smart, but it runs a lot of code, so we call it a smartphone, right? The other thing about these co this code is anyone anywhere in the world can interact with it. Right? It's completely accessible to anyone. There's no barriers to entry. And again, there's asterisk. risk. Of course there are. They're technical and it's still a little complicated to use. But no fundamental reason why you can't do business with someone in Somalia who has a, you know, a absolutely open platform just like publishing was for the web. Um, and the last one is that once the software is deployed, it will run as written and there's nothing you can do to stop that. Nobody can strong arm it, nobody can bully it, nobody can change the terms afterwards. For better or worse, once you enter the software, run the software, that's how it's going to run. Right? That's, uh, and because of this guarantee that it's going to run as executed, we call the software a contract. So that's where the term smart contract comes from. So this unstoppable little bit of software that anyone in the world can access. So let's look at a few examples. Uh, the currency app, of course, I already mentioned, is the most famous. A currency is a very simple thing. It's a list of accounts and balances with the function to transfer a number from one to the other. That's it. I mean, that's one page of computer code, right? So accounts, transfers, balances. That's it. Um, so interacting with one, well, I had this slide yesterday at HR Fest, so I should have updated this to to my, my example to pay the EODF organizers, done a great job, apologies. So you'd interact with it, you send a trans message saying, you know, remove 15 points from my account and add it to the other, you wait for the re return that it was done, and that's it, that's all a currency does. Right? It's very simple code, but it's not a, um, you know, it's not a theoretical example. Like there's hundreds of these running on Ethereum right now. And these on the right, these are all so of cryptocurrencies you might have heard about, they're not their own blockchain. This is all just a little piece of code running on Ethereum. Right? So, so that's an easy one. Uh, an exchange contract. If you have one of those currencies and I own another and we want to trade, normally we'd have a problem. Like I could send it to you and then wait for you to send it back and then if you don't, I have a problem. Or I could say, no, you pay me first and you don't trust me and you don't want to do that. Okay, so we maybe say, okay, let's, let's get a trusted third party. We both pay the lawyer and the lawyer does the exchange, but then we have to trust the lawyer not to run away. And so what, yeah, I mean, if you're in a country with a weak legal system, you can't even, you can't rely on contracts, you can't rely on lawyers, you can't rely on the police to enforce things. So with a smart contract that says this contract will trade X for Y or refund you, you can deposit your X into the contract and the contract has complete control over it. I no longer do the other person can deposit the Y into the contract and they've given up their control, given it to the contract, and the contract does the exchange. The contract can't do anything else. All it can do is either facilitate the exchange or refund. So there's no chance of theft. Nobody needs to trust the counterparty and you can do business with anyone anywhere in the world and you don't even need to know who it is. So that's a very powerful development, right? Um, 
Contract that counts votes are also popular examples. You know, it's an easy thing. If you say everyone in this room, we register you when you come in, and then I write, say, a contract saying everyone gets a vote, then you can all vote. You can interact with this voting contract, and then you know, the, the, con the code can count the votes. And we can combine smart contracts together. So if we have a voting contract, we can have another contract which acts on the result of a vote. You know, saying we can have a contract that, I don't know, holds a pot of money, and we say we can all vote on who should get it, and then that's what's going to happen, and nobody can stop that from happening. Once it's deployed, it's guaranteed that this is what we do. And if you were thinking about like making a club which has a law saying that you know, whenever the full moon falls on a Thursday, then there's a new election for treasurer, well, then that's what's going to happen. And you don't need to trust anyone to hold that election. You don't need to trust anyone to fairly count the votes. That's guaranteed. Like, and that's an autonomously running system. So um, it's, it's a very powerful idea that you can use this kind of software to coordinate with people over the internet. And you have these guaranteed procedures. Um, you know. Then the weaker the legal system is where you are, the more, more powerful this notion becomes. Gambling and casino contracts, also popular examples, because programmable money, you know, with guaranteed following certain rules. Right. So these are a few examples of simple ones, and now a more complicated one, colony, right? Colony, whole suite of smart contracts. What we want to do is manage work together amongst a group of people, evaluate each other, and it changes the decision-making weight of people so that those who cause trouble and are, are doing bad work get sort of depreciated, and those who do good work, their, their influence increases. We have dispute mechanism payments and a whole lot of stuff. Um, so that's the colony vision, <clears throat> right? There's, there's, a, there's a side to it which is work and accounting. There's a side to it which is governance um, and um, self-organizing self collectives. And I'm, I'm gonna, I'd love to get into a lot of these discussions with you, but uh, maybe afterwards because it's too much for a 20-minute talk. So colony is a family of smart contracts. Um, that enables collective governance of self-organizing, organically scaling, decentralized collectives is a long way of saying it allows us to do things together, right? That's what it really is all about, right? Um, we have these amazing tools to uh, communicate. Like you can start, work, you can start group, uh, you know, uh, some chat group somewhere, and then you can have text chat, video chat, audio chat, share files, share videos. Those are great tools for organizing, and people do amazing things with just that. The extra step we want to add is to allow us to manage m funds, to pay each other, evaluate each other, keep track of who's done how much. Right? That, that's the extra ingredient that's still missing. Okay, so here's a smart contract somewhere in the colony system, the smallest little piece. It's called a task, a little piece of work, and such a piece of work has an administrator, the person who creates it, who defines what this work should be, and you know, some due dates, some other metadata. Then they appoint another account, which is the evaluator. And the evaluator's job is to input to the smart contract, yes, this work was done well, or it wasn't. And then the payment for the task is also locked into the software. Of course, this is all programmable money. So uh, you know, when I, when I accept a piece of work, the bounty that I could earn is right there. Because, so I don't have to trust people to cough up the money after I do the work. As long as the evaluator says the work is done, the smart contract unlocks the funds and pays them to me. And me in this example is the, is the worker, the guy who got appointed. So orchestrating, orchestrating these tasks um, is, is sort of the heart of the day-to-day -day of the colony. You know? So we're, when we're a little work group, we just create little tasks and assign them to each other, evaluate each other. That's sort of how work gets done in the system, um, at least on the smart contract side. And then, um, you know, as a colony grows, the number of tasks grows, we have to Man, you know, to manage that complexity. The colony starts as a single domain, and we call, the, you know, we call the units in the colony domain. If it grows bigger, you might spawn subdomains. So here's an example, the research department, you might create a new domain. I created this as an example because that's usually where I live. And then if that grows too big, you subdivide more than create subdomains for various projects and research things you do. And each one of these domains has their own budget, and within each domain, you have your own tasks. So the idea is that as the colony grows, the units keep subdividing so that for a day-to-day -day work group, it becomes manageable, right? And there's a funding mechanism where the funding flows down from the big departments to the small departments, from the small departments into the tasks, and all the decision-making is local, so we keep as few people as possible to keep the decision-making fluid, 
And if there's a disagreement, we have, there's a dispute mechanism, and only if we really cannot resolve disputes locally within a domain, we can always escalate to a higher domain and to a higher domain. So the idea in this decentralized world is you cannot appeal to a higher boss, but you can appeal to a bigger group of people. But uh, your chances of winning a dispute in a bigger group of people become smaller and smaller. It's, you know, there's, there's costs involved because uh, you know, a lot of people's attention is required. So you, you know, we try to disincentivize that as much as possible. So you really only escalate if you have a good chance of winning. Try to keep all the decision making local and small. And so all of these activities you might do, the assigning work, evaluating work, dynamically allocating funding, um, all that. So that's what the whole colony protocol is about. Right. <coughs> okay. So, um, and then here's a quote um, that I like, because it might sound like it's really complicated what we've been talking about, like all these rules and how to evaluate and how to change people's decision-making uh, weight based on their input, based on how they won in disputes. Now, we can make that right, relatively complicated because it doesn't have to be implemented by humans. It it's implemented by software, so it's really not like other rules where it becomes really hard to take part. So colonies can be really easy to interact with even if the underlying system is complex. Right? Okay, so I'm going to pause on this slide for a moment. Enforced procedure is what blockchains give us. Right? As I said, if you say that you know, once a year you vote for a new chairman and you require to, uh, a quorum of at least so many votes and a majority of at least 60%, then that is absolutely guaranteed to be the way it is. Right? You, the, the blockchain means that whatever governance system you design, the, it's, the blockchain is going to dictatorially enforce that those pre procedures are maintained. Right? But procedures is one thing. It's not a whole governance system, but it's important because because you, you know, we are interacting with strangers over the internet or you're in a country with no strong legal system, if you can enforce that the votes are fairly counted or other procedures happen, that's a big gain from, from using these technologies. The other side is programmable incentives because the, we can program how you get rewarded for certain actions. And I don't just mean you getting paid, but of course payments can also be programmed. I can also program to say that People who cause a lot of disputes, they get their, their, their influence gets lowered down. Like, you know, influence is something we can, we, we, can, my, we can micromanage in the software to, to sort of make certain kinds of behavior to encourage them. So for one of the examples I like is, um, you know, you can always force a vote on a certain issue, like, which is... Um, and voting is bad because it's slow and cumbersome, but from a security perspective, if somebody is in a colony doing, trying to really cause trouble, I should be able to go in there and say, hey, this guy is causing trouble. This is not what we agreed to. Let's vote on it. And then if everyone votes, yep, you're right, that guy's wrong, we'll punish him. He'll have less influence. He'll lose his stake tokens or what, what have you. So it always has to be possible to force a vote on something. On the other hand, if I'm the one who keeps forcing votes and losing... Uh, because I just, you know, I'm just causing trouble for anyone else, then I should be the one being punished. And that's the kind of incentives you can program into the software so that it automatically weeds out the destructive behavior over time. Um, <clears throat> so, how would you get started in a colony? Right? Interacting with a colony should really be very simple. Right? It's about as simple as starting a, some group in a social network. Yes, we're interacting with smart contracts and this blockchain's all fancy complex technology doesn't mean that the interface has to be hard, right? The interface could look just like this. This is, you know, could be like any Web 2.0 system, you know, start new group, create new tokens, and deploy, right? So, and we are working on an app that works just like a Trello-based task management app that should be really easy to interact with these things. Um, and the other thing about getting started is um, you don't need upfront funding or anything, you, you create your own cryptocurrency and then you, get, you can get going. It does, might not have any monetary value yet, but you can immediately start assigning bounties and sort of paying people in this thing. So before I say cryptocurrency, don't think about it as having value. It could be things like bounties and levels. You know, it's, it's amazing what people will do for fake internet points. Right? <laughs> and no, and I say this, like, if I, volunteering for something, providing work, and then nobody acknowledges it and there's no record of it is very demotivating. But just saying, look, I have these tokens and here's, I can, everyone can see that I've done something, it's motivating. It might make me far more likely to start in. So we have this, this currency where you can, 
that, that, that people can get sort of paid in or to get started. So there's no, there's no barrier to entry in that level. And then we've got our reputation system, which gives influence to those who do the best work. And the more work you do, the more your peers like it, the more your influence will grow over time. And, and, but, um, okay, so no barrier to getting started. Not financial, not technical. Anyone can join. And all, everything you do is fairly accounted for, and, and, and nobody can screw you. Like, you, you the thing is, if you, if you join early, it's like, why should I be the first to join the nobody else yet? Well, I'll get to that later. So, joining a colony. What does joining a colony even mean? It just means you do a task. So there's a colony, and they create all the tasks that they want done, and you, you like this colony, you say, hey, that's something I could do. Let me do that task. If they accept you, you do the task, submit the work, and now you're a member. Just by doing that, you will automatically have some say in the governance of this colony, at least in our final vision of how this protocol should work. Why would you do that? Well, maybe you get paid. Of course, colonies can pay. That's one of the main features. Uh, but it might, might just be you believe in the project and you want to be part of it, or you want to have a say in the governance of that project because you don't just earn money, even if they don't, it's not a financial colony. It could be a completely nonprofit. Just by completing work, you earn influence. You can start steering where you think this project should go. So every colony has this internal economy, and there's the one which is the currency side and the other one which is influence side. And they're both, both you know, they're, they're, they're interlinked because the more you earn in terms of money, the more influence you get because it means you're doing positive things for the colony. But the, the influence economy, um, it's kind of the more interesting one because that's where the governance lives. And, and, and it's, it's here that we see the, you know... Uh, well, it's here that our reputation system really plays in and, and how, how you see the diffusion of power in a colony over time. But there's a lot of experiments still to be done. Like, so the colony, I've said, is governed by those who contribute. Um, so if you do good things for a colony, completing work, winning disputes, managing, evaluating work, those are the kind of things which will earn you reputation over time. On the other hand, if you fail to do work or lose disputes, your influence will decrease. And also if you don't do anything. So reputation decreases over time if you don't do anything. So it's not the kind of thing, it's thing where you can do a lot of early work, sit on your mountain of reputation and dictatorial ha dictate what happens. You know, you have to continue to contribute. So it's, a, it's supposed to be a dynamic kind of uh, process. Um, so my time is up. So I just want to pitch a big picture to you. I, I started with this Wikipedia idea of... Um, you know, how, mu how much we like to collaborate online, and how just little tools we need to achieve these amazing results, right? And someone talked about collective action problems, right? This is a co coordination problem. There's lots of problems where all of us would work to, if we all knew work together, we could achieve really important things. And if you look at collection, collective action, this is, um, one more minute, right? If you look at collective action problems, um, like the literature, they always say, oh, yes, yes, the free rider problem, because you don't want to do your part, because as long as everyone else does, you're fine. So you want to be a free rider. But there's another side to, to these problems, which are usually, I want to help. Of course I want to help, but I don't want to be the one idiot, you know, doing this. As long as everyone else does, I'll happily help. And I think this is far more important, right, this second one. And, and is this one that we could target with a colony-like system, right? Especially if you have this kind of a curve where like, the, the benefit, like it's, it's not good to be the first guy to start it, but as long as you have a credible belief that lots of people will join, uh, you'd be far more likely to join up. And especially if you have a system that keeps track of who were the early contributors and can, can reward them afterwards, then maybe this trough is not even that, that that's so scary anymore. So getting back to this vision of the ant colony, we've now got... We're developing now. I mean, this is very new technology. It's only just the first smart contract platform came out three years ago. And it's, it's, it's very new, but we can now have these tools that allow us to get into contractual agreements and financial agreements with strangers over the Internet in collaborative tools. And just... Um, I, I, I'm really excited to see how... You know, what kind of projects we can tackle and what, you know, how the, harvest this enthusiasm on the internet of all these people who want to work on these global problems. And now these coordination tools allow us to actually hopefully get there and, you know, really uh, surprise us with what we can do with these systems. So that's Colney. That's what the vision is about. Thank you for listening. Uh, sign up to the newsletter. It's, uh, if you want to keep track of what's happening, not just with us, but also in this space, it says v.ht slash colony newsletter. Um, and yeah, thank you very much.
v.ht slash colony newsletter. Mm -hmm. Or colony.io is our website, which is, you'll find a lot of the rest. Hello, everyone. I'm Esther Knight, the project manager of the conference. And uh, thank you, Aaron, for giving this great speech. I think this was a perfect start for our content part of the conference. I can only say, wow. <laughs> I, I have so many thoughts in my head right now, but I think uh, the others uh, must be the same way too. So what I would like to do is um, I would like you to form uh, little groups of three or four people. Just uh, turn around, no need to stand up or anything like that and uh, start discussing what were your first impressions. What would you like to hear more about? Um, is there anything that you didn't understand? Do you have any clarifying questions? Um, because how we are going to run our Q&A, um, after you talk in these uh, little groups, uh, you can post your questions on an online app, which I will show you right now. Okay, so once you have, sorry to interrupt.
Okay, so once you have your questions, you can write it down in the app. Hello. I know it's a great discussion starter, but let's continue this in the big circle. You don't hear me? Uh, talk louder, yeah? Okay, is this better now? Yeah? Okay, so what I'd like you to do now that you have discussed in your small group, what, you, what you'd like to hear more about, you can go to slido.com on your phone, just type in the room that is hashtag EODF18, and you can post the question there. Uh, you can also vote for the question, so we will uh, together uh, dis, um, decide which question Aaron will answer for us. Okay? So, uh, since we are ha already have a first one, let's start with the... Yeah, I'll happily jump right in on these questions. Yeah. So, I see a question here is, how do you deal with situations where you want to obfuscate the vote? Um, better? Okay, so how do I deal with situations where I want to obfuscate the vote? And privacy and blockchain, this is a really active area of research, and it's of course really important, because the blockchain being public, everything has a record. So when we were designing Colony, the first really important thing we thought about when we did voting is um, we don't want to get the bandwagon effect, where you see the running tallies as the vote happens, because to get swarm intelligence or, 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 the, or the wisdom of the crowd, you need to have everyone's vote be independent. So you're not allowed to be able to see what the running tallies are because that really distorts it. So we designed a system where all the votes are hidden uh, until the end when they are counted and then they are revealed and then they are fully public. You can see how the other members in your group voted. Um, that at least gets us past the bandwagon effect. So I'm guessing this question wants to say, what happens when we want to have an anonymous vote? Anonymous votes on the blockchain are possible, and we are talking to researchers about this. It takes uh, some advances in cryptography. There's, it's a very active area of research called zero-knowledge cryptography, where um, you can actually do a vote on a contract, on a smart contract, and you cannot see what the incoming votes are, and the only thing the contract will tell you is what the total is, but you can prove mathematically that the contract did the correct thing by correctly counting the votes, even though nobody can see what the votes are. But it uses really fancy cryptography, and these things are only just being added to the Ethereum blockchain these days. When the blockchain undergoes an upgrade, we're adding new cryptographic primitives to allow for these things. So that's an active area of research, but that's definitely the direction this whole field is moving in. Um, so that will be possible at some point. Although not yet. Existing examples. Um, so Colony hasn't actually launched yet. We've had, you know, this is very new. We're launching later this year, maybe early next year. That's sort of the time frame. Um, we've had some closed beta testing. Um, and the, some, you know, where people tried our early versions of the software and some failed pretty quickly and some ended up enjoying using it. Um, so the examples where it's most work, where it works best are things like software development and uh, the other one is digital agencies. And the reason are software developers are, yeah, they're very technical, so they don't have problems using these tools very early, but also they're used to organizing their work online and the work they do is like code that you can submit digitally and somebody can evaluate digitally. So it's much easier to, to serve as a first use case. And digital agencies, design agencies, also had like a small core team used to farming out a, a transactional-based work to a lot of contributors, and also that work is submitted digitally. So it was a much very close fit. So those were the examples. But um, we use those to gain insight into you know, how to actually make an interface that's usable and understandable and how to manage you know, these, these systems. So there's no real live examples of a distributed governance online collective because this stuff is still in development and hasn't been released and deployed yet. Um, yeah, how does Colony support more human types of work and can it support human dialogues for things less than black and white? Well, I'm not entirely sure I know what that means. Colony is supposed to be flexible enough to allow for any kind of work to be managed. So when I say there's a task on the um, 
on, 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 a smart, on a blockchain, it could just be a description, a text-based description. Here's what we want to have done. You know, like I want to go and you know, clean up the trash on this beach and, and submitting the work could be doing the work and then uploading a photo saying, look, I've done it. And then evaluating could be somebody who lives close by who looks out the window and says, yes, I agree, this has been done. So the system doesn't care what kind of work it is we're, we're managing. And um, for black and white, well, the, the ultimate arbiter of any decision is what the members of the colony think, weighted by their reputation. So if you don't know what everyone's agreement is, you can always say, you know, I'm going to force this into arbitration, which means the ultimate result is that there's a vote of the people within that domain, and that's what's the ultimate decider, and then that's it. Okay, so, yeah, so it, you mean non-transactional? Yeah, well, basically, yeah. In a lot of the cases we now register, are very confused about the Okay. Because right, so, yeah, so, they don't know what they're doing. So, yes, that, okay, that's, that's, a, that's an important point. So, yes, I, I made it sound like we're just creating tasks and doing, like, iterative, just work off these tasks. Um, that's just because that's a simple smart contract I can sort of... Uh, Describe, but it's also colony can do can you can totally hire people for salaried positions. It's just on the smart contract level, we kind of it looks uh, different. So, for example, when I said we had all these domains and the funding gets allocated continuously to these domains, then within the domains you create tasks. Well, it is possible that you have a, a domain with only a single person in it, and then we call that domain a salaried position, and you the only member you have that job. And then, you know, your front-end software can abstract away the, what's actually happening on the smart contract level, and then, you, then, then it's... So any colony system can allow for salary jobs, and it can, it can allow for other longer-term uh, positions where it's not transactional. Um, so it, it, there, there is flexibility there. And a lot of it is not... The, the complexity is not in the, on the smart contracts, but in making the right interface, the right abstractions that make it easy to map what we want as humans onto these interactions on the blockchain. Like the, the contracts have to be really simple because they have to be secure from a game theory perspective that you cannot you know, overwhelm a decision-making mechanism and, and hack your way into it. Um, so that's why on the smart contract level we have only the domains and the tasks and it's very basic, but we can abstract away from that and create all kinds of for more you know, soft arrangements. And, and the way the system works, really, is that as long as there's consensus within your group that you want to do something, you can, right? It's very flexible to allow for anything. You can do anything if you agree to it. It's just that when there is disagreement, it has to be safe. It has to be secure that, that, you, can, that you, you cannot be, you know, not one minority or can steal all the funds or what have you. So, so it, that balance we have to try and do. And on the smart contract level, they have to be secure, but they're flexible enough for all kinds of uh, work. Um, <coughs> right. How would I articulate clearly the business problem that Colony is trying to solve? Huh. Well, it's not, just, it's not one particular business problem, but... Um, there's an, here's an example that, um, so there was a, do you know the uh, Hyperloop project? So it's like an Elon Musk competition for some maglev train, and it had various teams competing, you know, from huge uh, technology companies and, and, and research universities. And then a group of people on the internet forum Reddit said, hey, we want to compete. And, you know, they had said we have engineers in the forum, we have scientists, we have everyone here, why don't we compete? And, you know, at first people laughed off the idea, but they got amazingly far. You know, people put in a lot of effort, a lot of time and money, and they cleared the first hurdle, the second and the third. But when that, pro when that started running into its scaling problems is when real money started becoming involved. And it, you could no longer rely on individuals to to donate that much time. And then when you want to crowdfund money, you have to figure out who's going to be the one who manages it and what are the legal structures. And those are the, you hit these limits of growth of this volunteer-based interaction. And Colony or, the, or a similar kind of software could take you just that extra step. It allows you to collectively fundraise and then collectively manage those funds. So 
it's not a particular problem I'm trying to solve. It's like a new way of, of, of doing, of, of, of cooperating online that we're trying to enable. Um, so, but there's other business problems. I mentioned yesterday, so I was at HR Fest. So there's aspects of this colony system you could use. Um, if you don't want to have the decentralized governance saying we're happy in our company, we've got our hierarchy, just using these tasks, you could have a system in a large company where project managers create work and create goals and just sort of publish them on their internal platform and anyone in the entire organization can pick them up and work on them as they have time available, as they find the work interesting and be completely flexible and find you know, unused talent in your global, in your workforce if it's a large company. And many companies like this extra flexibility and often it's administrative overhead that's so prohibitive. But if you do things with these smart contracts, all the accounting is automatic. The paying people the right amounts for all these work or at least accounting for it is automatic and, and, and it allows you to be very flexible in assigning work across a large workforce or even externally, globally, you can, so just that task management, the fact that the payments and the accounting and the work are one and the same thing, and that all of that extra administrative work comes for free, allows you just to be, be extra flexibility and we're less reliant on hierarchy in a traditional organization. So, I, you know, I, I always like to pitch the vision of the decentralized, autonomous, global collective, but the colony works in much smaller scales too. The tools are, you know, how does the system make money? Um, well, so every colony can have its own business model. I don't prescribe what a colony does for its business. The colony network as a whole does have a business model. Uh, there's a special colony, uh, which we call the meta colony, but all it does, it runs, it, 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 it's, it's tasked with uh, furthering the software for uh, the colony system and to run the reputation system. So calculating what everyone's reputation should be is a very complicated calculation that cannot be done in a blockchain. So somebody has to run this reputation system and that's, there's a colony responsible for that and as a, as a, in return they get fees paid by all the other colonies. Um, but not every colony has to be a for-profit business. Like it, that's really up to you. And you can even ensure that your colony is not a for-profit business. So you can make your internal currency hyperinflate automatically just to make sure that it's never more than counts like upvotes. You know, it's not a currency. So th that that that's not. Um, so nope. Every, every no, the colony pays in their own tokens. So those that are for not for-profit co colonies that where their token's worthless, they don't actually pay any fees, but those where the token represents ownership in a real company where it has a real exchange traded value, they would be ending up paying more fees, um, something like that. So the, the more value flows through your colony, the more the fees are that you'd pay off to, this, to the meta colony because the more you rely on it for the system. Yeah, I might repeat the question because I think for online viewers, So where does this fall short? What are the limits? So right now, the limits are in scaling, right? The blockchain as it runs now is far too slow and far too expensive to use to support any of this, like any, on a large scale, right? But that's not, a, that's not a colony specific problem. All of us in the blockchain space have this scaling issue. Um, so blockchains on its own, it's, it's like a game we play online with random strangers to come to consensus on something. With Bitcoin, it's coming to consensus on who has how many Bitcoin uh, and what orders are the transactions. In Ethereum, it's like coming to consensus on what is the state of this simulated computer. And this consensus game, I mean, while it's amazing that we even have such a thing, is very slow and very expensive. So if we can do, you know, hundreds of transactions, that's fine, but we're not going to be able to do millions because the system just can't cope. So it's gonna slow to a crawl and the prices are gonna spike. So those are the technical limitations. Um, beyond that, I don't wanna speculate too much. I think when we do launch and we see people try out colonies, a lot of them will fail completely and maybe some will succeed and we're gonna look very closely as to why they succeeded, why they failed. Because there's a lot of numbers that go into this that we sort of made up. 
Like, you know, what's the minimum quorum requirement for a vote to pass? What is the minimum stake somebody needs to put up before they can trigger a vote? What's the correct decay rate for reputation? We have no way of knowing what, 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 what the, you know, we've no, no basis on which to, to take this except sort of, you know, finger in the air, estimate what we think is good. So in the first wave of colonies, we're going to collect a lot of empirical data to learn more on how these systems act and interact. And that'll be the project for most of next year. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Time for one last question. Yeah. Um, so let me take on the, the why does it run on the blockchain, right? Because anything else would require someone to run it, and that someone has complete power over everything, right? It is the, the blockchain that allows us to, to do business with strangers without having to trust the stranger. And the blockchain, it's stubbornly running on its own. I don't have to trust it because I know what it's going to do. Like, it, it's a stubbornly going to execute these steps and nobody is running the server. Nobody's controlling it. Nobody can revert something. Nobody can delete something. So that's the security guarantee that we didn't have before. I mean, we could say, okay, let's just all do this on Facebook groups and maybe you can get similar functionality, but you're trusting Facebook. And it's, you know, that's a dangerous thing I guess, because the, having anyone who can censor anything or delete things or revert transactions, that's not going to be a, a, a scalable platform, you know, for, for this, global, uh, this global interaction, right? So it's just like the web allowed anyone to publish and you didn't need somebody to give you permission. There wasn't some company saying, hey, we give everyone permission to phone in and we'll write whatever they say and publish it in our newspaper. No, it was this complete permission that anyone can interact from anywhere and, and without, without, without censorship. And the blockchain allows that for commerce. It's this autonomous space that anyone can access and nobody can, can control. And that's really important, we find, for you know, even enabling to make this viable. Yeah. I'm sorry we are... I'm sorry, Val. No, it's not. Like, it's, okay. a blockchain is an open platform. Let, let me step in here just a moment. I'm so sorry, but we are using this very, very cool tool called Slido. And I know that it's sometimes hard to, uh, to only wait until your answer gets questioned, but I think... Okay, but I understand. We don't have time for any clarifying questions above what we have in, in the script. And let me say one sentence to that. Yes. To interact with a system like this, you need to download a piece of software that is open source and readily available, and as soon as it's running on your computer, you are part of the network, indistinguishable from any other part of the network. Like, there really is no barrier to access beyond that. Thank you so much, Aaron. This was fantastic. So right now we have our first coffee break. Uh, anyone who signed up for the random coffee can find their coffee part.